Good afternoon, honorable judges. My name is Eliana Stemme from the Branch Area Career Center FFA chapter. The title of my speech is, where is the sizzle? Honorable timekeeper, I'm ready to begin. As soon as I arrived home from school, the moment I stepped through the door, I smelled the incredibly well-seasoned and sizzling burgers frying in the skillet. Mmm, a big juicy burger cooked in a cast iron skillet is one of my favorite meals. If my mom were to cook burgers for dinner one night, where could the meat have come from? Option one, we raised a steer from calf to maturity on a mixture of pasture and grain. Option two, we bought the burger from a trusted super supermarket, which likely came from a steer raised on grain in a feedlot. Option three, the burger was raised in, wait, what? Created in a bioreactor tank in a science lab? No way. I am here today to inform you about option three, the big juicy burger being grown in a lab. To begin, I will give you an overview of the process to create lab-grown meat. Next, I will discuss the pros and finally the cons concerning lab-grown meat. First, the, the production of lab-grown meat is not as difficult as it may sound. According to a report written in the Wall Street Journal, scientists only need a single muscle cell from an animal to create the meat product. The cell is then placed into a bioreactor tank. It is fed certain nutrients and oxygen in order to allow the muscle cell to multiply. As the cell multiplies, the surface area and thickness of the raw meat will grow. Finally, over the course of three to five weeks, the cells are fully developed. They are ready to be supplied to a consumer and eaten. That is the simplified process to create lab-grown meat. Second, there are several pros concerning the production of lab-grown meat. One pro is that lab-grown meat is an additional source of protein for the world. To help you visualize this, consider solar and wind energy. Most people call these alternative sources of energy. It is a good thing for the world to have a variety of energy sources. Similarly, it will be a good thing for the world to have a variety of protein sources. This lab-grown meat will help feed the growing population and the percent of the population that does not have a reliable source of protein. This alternative meat is also needed because there's only a limited amount of land. This land must be divided between growing all the crops needed to feed all the livestock and poultry needed for this growing population. Another positive aspect of this lab-grown meat is that scientists will be able to grow non-local foods locally. Take, for example, the Midwestern states that must import crab meat from Maryland. With lab-grown meat, the Midwestern states wouldn't have to import seafood. Instead, they could simply produce it in a local lab. This brings me to my third point. Along with pros comes cons. One con to lab-grown meat is expense. According to NBC News, the first lab-grown burger cost $280,400 to produce in 2013. However, the Dutch company Moza Meats expects the price to come down about $10 in 2021. If you were to compare a lab-grown burger with a Big Mac costing about $5.30, the lab-grown burger costs about $4.70 more. A second con is that the production of lab-grown meat could actually hurt the environment more than it saves it. According to scientists, the carbon dioxide from the energy used to make lab-grown meat is likely to be more damaging to the environment long-term than methane gas produced by cows. A, another con is the taste and texture. Many companies such as the startup Eat Just, who's famous for their egg made of plants, have not yet figured out how to grow fat in a lab. So there's too much leanness to the meat, which causes a noticeable difference in taste and texture. A final con is that the production and consumption of lab-grown meat could change animal agriculture as we know it. Many meat processing businesses may be forced to shut down, leaving many people without a job. 
The National Cattlemen's Beef Association is also concerned about the false labeling of this lab-grown meat they like to call fake meat. The Midwestern state of Missouri passed a law in August of 2018 making it illegal to call something meat if it was not derived from livestock or poultry. This law also requires the label to indicate if the meat was produced in a lab. In conclusion, we've discussed the process, the pros, and the cons concerning lab-grown meat. My mom has yet to make a lab-grown burger, but according to science, I may get to taste one in the near future. The only question I have is, when my mom fries the burgers up in her cast iron skillet, will they have the same sizzle? Honorable timekeeper, this concludes my presentation. Honorable judges, I will now entertain any questions you may have. Good afternoon, judges. My name is Mackenzie Henniger, and joining me today are Mara Tiernan and Izzy Ensley, as well as Stephen Turner as our non speaking technology member. Today, we are representing the Marshall and the Fate chapter in the demonstration team contest. To best view our presentation, you can click the gallery view in the top right hand corner of your screen. Make sure all three of our screens are visible. And judges, if you could please consider turning off your camera until questions, that would be greatly appreciated. The title of our presentation is A Fresh Arrangement for a Rosy Future, How the New Pool Design at Home. Honorable timekeeper, we are ready to begin. Hello, my name is Mackenzie, and as the owner of Finch's Flowers, today my business associates, Lauren, Izzy, and I are going to demonstrate how to prep the vase. Select complimentary fresh cut flowers, prepare flowers, foliage, and filler, and create a beautiful floral arrangement. We will also touch on the appropriate water temperature for floral arrangement, floral food, and how to price arrangements for sale. Floriculture production is a multi billion dollar industry. It consists of fresh cut flowers. Cut cultivated greens, potted flowering plants, foliage plants, and bedding plants for use in gardens. According to the most recent summary from the USDA National Agricultural Physics Service, Illinois, Maryland, and Michigan are the leading states in floriculture production, especially the wholesale value of floriculture sales. In the summer of 2020, all four categories experience growth except fresh cut flowers. This year was especially harsh for local flower shops as businesses were forced to shut down, weddings were postponed, and traditional funerals were restricted. It is estimated that the industry suffered a 6.2% revenue reduction. This is the industry's single worst financial loss in recent history. My floral shop is no exception to these statistics. In addition to a $12,000 decrease in sales, Finch's Flowers had to lay off all of their employees for three months in 2020. Although experts are optimistic our industry will recover, small business owners like me are forced to think outside the box in order to keep our businesses viable. Izzy, Mackenzie, and I recently brainstormed ideas to help food sales while also generating excitement to shop local. Today, we are laying the groundwork for Fitch's Flowers virtual tutorials where customers can call or visit our website to order a flower arranging kit that we will deliver directly to their home. This kit will include five floral food packets as well as the homemade preservative we will be demonstrating today. A clean vase, floral tape, fresh cut flowers. And for demonstration purposes today, we are using real looking silk flowers, foliage and filler, a ribbon, and an instruction card with directions to access the online tutorial which will educate our customers on how to arrange their flowers. Sure, customers can still purchase an arrangement for 
specially arranged by one of us, but we believe this opportunity is a fun way to develop a new skill while safely quarantining at home, similar to that home cooking or painting class, and it will help save our business. So the Toros Walker customers through the process we use in my flower shop for professionally arranging flowers retail sale. Let's spend the next few minutes discussing the key points we will include in this tutorial. Every beautiful arrangement begins with a clean base and the right water. Although it seems simple enough, there are important points to consider before turning on the tap, including water temperature, floral food, and periodically changing the water in your vase to ensure your floor arrangements last as long as possible. Before you place your first flower in the vase, it is imperative to ensure you are using the appropriate water temperature. First, hot water is harmful to flowers and should never be used. Just like we cook our food in hot water, hot water can also cook the flowers. On the flip side, cold water, which is generally 60 degrees or lower, moves up a stem too slowly and can cause air bubbles to form, restricting the flower's ability to take up water. Warm water between 100 and 110 degrees is the most appropriate temperature as it causes water to travel up a stem faster and it keeps the moisture in the flower. Can we just talk about why it's important to periodically change the water in our arrangements? Yes, Mackenzie, I never talked about that. And that's an important point to include in this presentation as well. It is important to remember to change the water in your arrangement and clean your base every other day. This is because the stems of flowers can cause for horrible bacteria to grow, which in turn can cause your flowers to wilt faster. Hey, Mara, remember that experiment we did in botany class? The one where we tested water and water to compare soda? That's right. We used a three to one ratio of water to clear soda, and it acted as a preservative. This happens because fresh cut flowers use sugar as a food source. Also, the slightly acidic water travels up the stem faster than neutral water. Interestingly enough, both of these ingredients are also found in floral food packets. If you want to add longevity to your fresh cut flowers, floral food is a great way to conserve your flowers with three necessary ingredients. An acidifier, such as lemon juice, which lowers the pH of the water and allows for increased water intake. Sugar, which provides your flowers the energy they need to be brighter and fresher. And surprisingly, bleach, which slows down the formation of harmful bacteria in your vase. If you don't have an extra packet of floral food laying around, you can easily replicate it at home by using the recipe we found online. To make homemade flower food, you want to add two teaspoons of lemon juice, one teaspoon of sugar, one teaspoon of bleach, and one quart of lukewarm water. It is important to remember that when you change the water in your arrangement every other day, you should have a packet of world food or the homemade preservative we've made today in order to keep your flowers fresher for longer. Great. I think this is a good beginning to our tutorial. It clearly demonstrates the importance of water temperature and a food source and arrangement. Next, we should include the importance of the flower colors we choose in our arrangement. Statistics show that visual appeal is the number one factor customers use in choosing an arrangement, and complementary colors are the most attractive. Hey, Mackenzie, should we include? A color wheel in this kit? We could, or we could also simply mention it online as they're easily found in our tutorial. A, a color wheel is an important tool in a flower shop as it helps us to find complementary colors. Complementary colors can be found diagonally from each other on the color wheel. For example, yellow, Chris well with purple, and blue, Chris well with orange. Also, white 
is a neutral tint. It goes along with all the colors on the color wheel. This is all great information so far. Next, we'll prepare our flowers, foliage, and fillers. Though we use florist tools, our customers can use a common pair of hassle scissors to slightly trim the bottom of each stem at a 45 degree angle, like we are demonstrating here. This allows for increased water intake and increases the stem surface area. Next, we prepare the flowers and strip the flowers any unwanted leaves. We do this by pinching the top of the flower like this and pulling down with the opposite hand to remove the leaves. No leaves should be left on a flower stem as they're typically the first part of flower to break down. Thus, it can contribute to unwanted bacteria growth in your vase. Once we've finished prepping our flowers, we can prepare our vase. Using floral tape will create a grid pattern on top of our vase, which in turn will help hold our stems in place. Now, we should be ready to actually instruct our participants on how to arrange their flowers. Floral arrangement has three key components, foliage, fresh cut flowers, and filler. Examples of common foliage used in our industry include eucalyptus, lemon leaf, and baker's fern. Each of these types of foliage holds up well in an arrangement and are readily accessible year round. Today, we are using Baker's Fern as we have it available in our cooler. Floral arrangements typically contain three to four foliage stems. Next, we will add our stars of the show, our fresh cut flowers. Of course, roses are the most popular of the featured flowers and have an average life of five to seven days. Carnations, Gerber daisies, and mums are also popular in arrangements and have an average life of up to 14 days. Today, we are using my personal favorite, Gerber daisies. We will also include some yellow solidigo aster as our accent flowers. Finally, we will need to complete the empty spaces of our arrangement with filler. Popular filler types include baby's breath, Bells of Ireland, or Fever Few Daisies. Today, we are using Baby's Breath with this particular arrangement. Wow, this arrangement looks beautiful, Mackenzie. It is proportioned well, visually appealing, and has a nice flower to filler ratio. Thank you, Mara. This ribbon can be tied around the vase as a finishing touch. Wow, Mackenzie, that really ties it all together? Literally. Great. Now it is time to start gathering the materials we will need to create our kits. The vase, floral food, floral tape, ribbon, and packaging retail for approximately $4.50 per kit. The flowers, foliage, and filler wholesale for approximately $22.50 per kit. It will take one member of my team approximately an hour to complete a kit at $14 per hour. And our delivery charge is $8.50 locally. Adding that all together, this particular kit could be sold for $49.50. Although most of the costs associated with the kit are fixed and do not fluctuate significantly, the cost of flowers can vary throughout the year depending on availability and demand. If we were to replace these Gerber daisies with roses, for example, this kit could cost upwards of $55. Once we have finished packaging all the materials, we can finish this kit off with an instruction card. This will include a synopsis of all the information we discussed today, as well as the access information for the online tutorial. So let's review the points we are going to include in this tutorial. Preparing a vase for a flower arrangement, including water temperature and floral food. We also remind them to change the water in their vase every other day and add a new packet of flower food or use the homemade preservative we demonstrated today. 
using a color wheel to select visually complementary flowers for their arrangement, preparing flowers, foliage, and filler for arrangement, and arranging flowers, foliage, and filler in a vase to create a beautiful vase arrangement. In Mackenzie, you have set a reasonable price point for these kits, making them an affordable yet fun option for our customers. I am glad to launch this new idea and optimistic to provide our shop with supplemental income as the community slowly returns to normal life. I am thrilled to start this project. It is important to support local flower shops, even more so in today's economy. Before 2020, 40% of all fresh cut flowers were sold at large scale supermarkets, and that percentage is increasing modestly, creating a great competition with small floral business owners like me. Now it's time to start creating, advertising, and selling our new kits. Our references have been listed throughout our presentation, and for your convenience today, we've also emailed a copy of the contest chair. I'm the timekeeper. This concludes our presentation, and we may now entertain any questions you may have. Good afternoon. My name is Olivia Woodring, and I am proud to represent the Ravana FFA chapter. I will be presenting my speech in response to the second prompt of agri-science and technology, which asks, why is the preservation and expansion of pollinators important to our food supply? And what can FFA members do to help? Madam Timekeeper, I am ready to begin. It's an average Friday afternoon and school just ended. Instead of going home, I make my way to my district's elementary school. As a volunteer for Destination Imagination, I spend the next two hours working with young students to rehearse and research for a five minute long skit about honeybees. At the young ages of five through seven, these students are already passionate about saving our pollinators. But why are pollinators so important? Let's go back to our biggest contributing pollinators, honeybees. According to the USDA, honeybees make up one third of our global food supply. In other words, without honeybees, these foods would not be produced. Likewise, 90% of Michigan crops are directly dependent on honeybees, according to michiganbees.org. Unfortunately, bees are dropping at an alarming, alarming rate. Substances such as neonicotinoids, disease, pests such as the varroa mite, and the scarcely known colony collapse disorder are all contributing to the decline of our pollinators. Additionally, conservative estimates suggest that the global population is to surpass 9 billion by 2050 and 10.9 billion by 2100. If we are to feed the exponentially increasing population, we also need to expand our bee populations rather than only preserving them. So what can FFA members do to help? Personally, I have written a children's book about the day in the life of a bee for Farm Days, an annual event that my FFA chapter hosts. I have also done a class-based demonstration on harvesting honey. These opportunities have allowed me to share my knowledge of pollinators with younger students as well as fellow classmates. However, to make the biggest difference, agri-science education programs need to have more resources. I was lucky enough to aid in my school winning a $100,000 rural tech grant, which will teach components of agri-science, technology, and entrepreneurship. Beekeeping will be the main way that students will utilize these concepts. They will be learning about the problems bees face, 
using technologies to help solve these problems on a small scale level, working with leaders of the apiary and technology industries, and even starting a local business. This innovative program will not only teach students about the problems of the future, but will also give them the critical thinking and problem solving skills they will need to actually solve them. So by helping young students, informing fellow classmates and being part of innovative agri-science curriculums with real world applications, students like me can make a difference in supporting our food supply. The risks pollinators face, their sheer importance, and the increasing human global population are why pollinators are so critical to our future. Thank you. Madam Timekeeper, this concludes my presentation. I will now accept any questions from the judges. Good afternoon, honorable judges and guests. We are the Mason FFA Junior High Connected Meeting Team. My teammates and I will introduce ourselves starting at my left. Lizzie West, Secretary. Caitlin Granowski, Advisor. Wesley Rogers, Sentinel. Vivian Chase, Vice President. Owen Sheridan, Treasurer. Anna Bennett, Reporter. And myself, Amelia Barnum, serving as Chair. Item of business. Your FFA advisor has noticed that many individuals in your age group and older own and frequently use all carrying vehicles, ATVs. While these vehicles are used both for recreation and for work, they can be very dangerous if used improperly. Your chapter advisor has asked you to work with a local ATV dealer to plan and host a safety training program for students in your school. Abilities to demonstrate. To call for a division of the assembly, to receive a motion of business without, with or without an amendment and receive a motion to lay it on the table and to rise to a point of order. Madam Timekeeper, we're ready to begin. The meeting room will come to order. We're now holding a meeting of the Mason FFA Junior High Connected Meeting Team. Madam Vice President, are all officers at their stations? I shall call the roll of officers, determine if they're at their station and report back to you, Madam President. The Sentinel. Stationed by the door. Your duty is there. Through this door press many friends of the FFA. It is my duty to see that the door is open to our friends at all times and that they are welcome. I care for the meeting room and the paraphernalia. I strive to keep the room comfortable and assist the president in maintaining order. The reporter. The reporter is stationed by the flag. Why by the flag? As the flag covers the United States of America, so I strive to inform the people in order that every man, woman, and child may know that the FFA is a national organization that reaches from the state of Alaska to the Virgin Islands and from the state of Maine to Hawaii. The treasurer. Stationed at the emblem of Washington. Your duties there. I keep a record of receipts and disbursements, just as Washington kept his farm accounts, carefully and accurately. I encourage thrift among the members and strive to build up our financial standing through savings and investments. George Washington was better able to serve his country because he was financially independent. The secretary. Stationed by the ear of corn. Your duties there. I keep an accurate record of all meetings and correspond with other secretaries wherever corn is grown and FFA members meet. The advisor. You're by the owl. Why station by the owl? The owl is a time-honored emblem of knowledge and wisdom. Being older than the rest of you, I am asked to advise you from time to time as the need arises. I hope that my advice will always be based on true knowledge and ripened with wisdom. Madam Vice President, why do you keep the plow at your station? The plow is the symbol of labor and tillage of the soil. Without labor, neither knowledge nor wisdom can accomplish much. My duties require me to assist at all times in directing the work of our organization. I preside over meetings in the absence of our president, who is placed as beneath the rising sun. Why is the president so stationed? The rising sun is a token of the new era of agriculture. If we follow the leadership of our president, we shall be led out of the darkness of selfishness and into the glorious sunlight of brotherhood and cooperation. Madam President, all officers are at their stations. Thank you, Madam Vice President. 
The secretary will call the roll of members. There are seven members and several guests present, Madam President. Thank you. FFA members, why are we here? <laughs> to practice brotherhood, honor agricultural opportunities and responsibilities, and develop those qualities of leadership which an FFA member should possess. May we accomplish our purposes. I now declare this meeting of the Mason FFA Junior High Connect and Beauty team duly open for a transaction of business or pension to any matters which may properly be presented. Madam President Owen. I move to suspend the rules by suspension of officer and committee reports and proceed with the end of the day. Second. second. It is moved by Owen and second to suspend the rules by dispensing officer and committee reports and proceed with the end of the day. Since this motion is unamendable, undebatable, and requires a two thirds vote, we will not proceed to vote by rising. All those in favor of suspending the rules, please rise. Thank you, be seated. All opposed, please rise. Six to zero, suspend the rules, passes. The floor is open. Madam President. Anna. I move to plan an ATV safety training for students in our school. Second. That's moved by Anna and second to plan an ATV safety training for students in our school. Is there any debate? Madam, Madam President. President. Owen. I rise to point of order. Anna, state your point. Maker of the motion has first rights to debate. Point well taken. Anna, you have the floor. I rise in favor of this motion. Thousands of people are injured by using these improperly. If we do this, we decrease the risk of injury. Vote yes. Is there any further debate? Madam President. President. Katie. I rise in favor of this motion. This would be a good way to keep students in our school system safe. Vote yes. Is there any further debate? Madam President. Owen. I rise in favor of this motion. Having a ATB plant safety system would decrease death. Vote yes. Is there any further debate? Hearing none, we should not proceed to vote. All those in favor of playing an ATV safety training for our students in our school say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. Ayes have it. Motion passes. We will plan an ATV safety training for students in our school. The floor is open. Madam, Madam President. President. Lizzie. I move to hand out t-shirts to the all the people who come. Okay. I just move by Lizzie and send you to hand out t-shirts to all the people who come. Is there any debate? Madam President. President. Lizzie. If we hand out t-shirts, people will be able to remember this event and remember what they learned. Vote yes. Is there any further debate? Madam, Madam President. President. Vivian. Although I agree with handing out t-shirts, we have more urgent business that we need to attend to. Therefore, I move to lay this motion on the table. Second. It is moved by Vivian and second to lay this motion on the table. Since this motion is unamendable and undebatable, we will not proceed to vote. All those in favor of laying this motion on the table say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. No. Ayes have it. Motion table. The floor is open. Madam President. Wesley. I move we do this event on the second Saturday in April at the fairgrounds. Second. second. That is moved by Owen and second to do this event on the second Saturday in April at Fairgrounds. Is there any debate? Madam, Madam President. President. Wesley. I rise in favor of this motion. Doing this event at the Fairgrounds would be a good idea because there is a lot of open space and a lot of, so people can stay separated and know what, how to present safety. Vote yes. Is there any further debate? Madam, Madam President. President. Vivian. I rise against this motion. We should have it a few days because if some people miss it, they won't be able to get the information they need. Vote no. Is there any further debate? Madam, Madam President. President. Owen. I rise in favor of this motion. Having it on the fairgrounds would be very open space and having it in April would mean that we could do it outside. Vote yes. Is there any further debate? Madam President. Wesley. I rise in favor of this motion. Having it at the fairgrounds and in April would be a good idea because it would be right before the summer starts and when people go to ride their ATVs and vehicles in the summer, they would know how to do it safely. Vote yes. Is there any further debate? Hearing none, we should not proceed to vote. All those in favor of doing this event on the second Saturday in April at the fairgrounds say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. No. Ayes have it. Motion. Division. Division of the assembly has been called for. We will now proceed with more accurate vote. All those in favor of doing this event on the second Saturday in April at the fairgrounds. Please rise. Thank you. Be seated. All opposed, please rise. Four to two. Motion passes. The floor is open. Madam President. Katie. I move to have the reporter advertise for this event on social media. Second. And it's moved by Katie and second is have the reporter advertise for this event on social media. Is there any debate? Madam, Madam President. President. Katie. I rise in favor of the motion. Many kids in middle school are on social media and this would be a good way to get the word out to them. Vote yes. 
Is there any further debate? Madam, Madam President. President. Anna. With so many people using social media, it would be inefficient to not use social media to publicize for this event. Vote yes. Is there any further debate? Madam, Madam President. President. Vivian. I rise in favor of this. If we do this, they'll be able to comment on it. And so if they have any questions, they we can reach out to them so they figure them out. Vote yes. Is there any further debate? Hearing none, we should not proceed to vote. All those in favor of having the reporter advertise this event on social media, say aye. Aye. Thank you, Madam Timekeeper. Eight minutes has elapsed. All opposed, say no. Ayes have it. Motion passes. We will have the reporter advertise this event on social media. The floor is open. Madam President. Lizzie. I move the lo local ATZ dealer come to give a presentation at 3 p.m. Second. It is moved by Lizzie and Second to have a local ATV dealer come and present at 3 p.m. Is there any debate? Madam, Madam President. President. Lizzie. This would be a good idea because they know all about ATVs. And if we have this at 3 p.m., it'll be a good time to start so people won't be during, doing anything. Vote yes. Is there any further debate? Madam, Madam President. President. Anna. This, I rise in favor of this motion. This person would know how to properly use ATVs and could teach us how to do it properly. Vote yes. Is there any further debate? Madam President. Owen. I rise in favor of this motion. Um, Having this at three o'clock, most people won't have sports or anything to do. Vote yes. Is there any further debate? Hearing none, we should not proceed to vote. All those in favor of having a local ATV dealer come and present at 3 p.m., say aye. Aye. All opposed, say no. Ayes have it. Motion passes. We will have a local ATV dealer come and present at 3 p.m. The floor is open. Is there any further business? Madam Secretary. Do you have a record of any further business which now be transacted? I have none, Madam President. Does any member know of any new or unfinished business which might properly come before this meeting? We are about to adjourn this meeting of the Mason FFA Junior High Connect Immediate Team as we mingle with others let us be diligent in labor, just in our dealings, courteous to everyone, and above all, honest and fair in the game of life. Fellow FFA members and guests, join me in a salute to our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I now declare this meeting adjourned. Thank you, Madam Timekeeper. This concludes our presentation. Honorable judges, we are now ready to entertain any questions you may have. Good afternoon, honorable judges and guests. We are the Mason FFA Parliamentary Procedures Team. My teammates now introduce ourselves, starting at my left. Katie Donnan, Secretary. Tamara Dowding. Megan Hills. Alec Burns. William Barnum. And myself, Emma Barnum, serving as chair. As the percentage of our population with a connection to farms and agricultural life continues to decline, so does the public's knowledge about agriculture. Your chapter public relations committee has decided to develop a series of three podcasts to help educate the public about modern agriculture and has asked your group for assistance with this project. Abilities to demonstrate, to direct an appeal from the decision of the chair, to move a main motion and withdraw the motion, to move to limit or extend limits of debate, to receive and dispose of a motion, its amendment, and an amendment to the amendment, to consider an item of business and receive a motion to refer it to a committee. Madam Timekeeper, we are ready to begin. The meeting room will come to order. We're now holding a meeting of the Mason FFA Parliamentary Procedures Team. Madam Chair. Megan. I move to suspend the rules by dispensing of opening and closing ceremonies, officer committee reports, and proceed with the item of the day. Second. The motion is made by Megan and seconded to suspend the rules by dispensing of opening and closing ceremonies, officer and committee reports, and proceed with the item of the day. Since this motion is unamendable, undebatable, and requires a two-thirds vote, we will now proceed to vote by rising. All those in favor of suspending the rules, please rise. Thank you, be seated. All opposed, please rise. Five to zero, suspend those passes. The floor is now open. Madam Chair. Alec. I move to develop a series of podcasts about modern agriculture. Second. Second. 
The motion is made by Adam Seckney to develop a series of podcasts about modern agriculture. Is there any debate? Madam Chair. Alex. I urge this assembly to help me in passing this motion. Developing a series of podcasts about modern agriculture will allow us to be able to reach out to members of our community who may not know much about agriculture and where their food comes from and make sure that they are well-informed and can be well-informed consumers that will make sure to make the right purchases and help support our local economy. Vote yes on this motion. Is there any further debate? Madam, Madam Chair. Chair. Katie. I rise in favor of this motion. Many of our students and people of the community have been staying home due to COVID this year, so podcasts would be an easy way to reach out to them and still make sure that they're getting the information important to our community. Vote yes on this motion. Is there any further debate? Madam Chair. William. Uh, please help me in supporting this motion. Having um, participated in the state fair in the past, um, I have, I've noticed that many people uh, simply just have misinformation about agriculture, and this would, and people would really appreciate um, knowing where their food come from, comes from. Vote yes. Is there any further debate? Hearing none, we will not proceed to vote. All those in favor of developing a series of podcasts about modern agriculture, say aye. 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 All opposed say no. I just have it. The motion passes. We will develop a series of podcasts about modern agriculture. The floor is open. Madam, Madam Chair. Chair. Megan. I move to work on the podcast every Wednesday. Second. Second. The motion is made by Megan and Seconded to work on the podcast every Wednesday. Is there any debate? Madam, Madam Chair. Chair. Alec. I rise to a point of order. Megan, state your point. We make your motion has first rights to debate. Point not well taken. Alec, you have the floor. I appeal to the decision of the chair. Second. A the chair feels that point of order is not well taken because Alec rose first for debate. Shall the decision of the chair be sustained? All those in favor of sustaining the decision of the chair, say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. No. The no's have it. Decision of the chair shall not be sustained. <coughs> Megan, you have the floor. I just assembly to vote yes on this motion. We need to have time to develop these podcasts as they could take a long time to make. Vote yes on this motion. Is there any further debate? Madam Chair. Samara. I move to amend the motion by adding the words before school. Second. Second. The amendment is made by Samara and seconded to amend the motion by adding the words before school. Is there any debate? Madam, Madam Chair. Chair. Samara. Vote with me in passing this motion. Working on these before school will make sure that we have plenty of time um, before classes begin for students to be able to um, get this done. Vote with me in passing this amendment. Is there any further debate? Madam Chair. Alec. I move to amend the amendment by adding the words in the agri. Second. Second. The amendment is made by Alec and seconded to amend the amendment by adding words in the ad room. Is there any debate? Madam, Madam Chair. Alec. Please help me in passing this amendment. Having this in the ad room will allow a, a large space where we will be able to properly social distance. And many of our members are comfortable in this space. We'll have adequate materials to be able to make sure that this podcast is done well. Please help me in passing this motion. Is there any further debate? Hearing none, we will not proceed to vote. All those in favor of amending the amendment by adding words in the ad room so that the amendment would read before school in the ad room, say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. Ayes have it, amendment passes. <coughs> Is there any debate on the amendment which now reads before school in the ad room? Hearing none, we will not proceed to vote. All those in favor of amending the motion by adding words before school in the ad room so that the motion would read to work on the podcast every Wednesday before school in the ad room, say aye. 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 All opposed say no. I have it. Amendment passes. Is there any debate on the motion which now reads to work on the podcast every Wednesday before school in the ad room? Hearing none, we will not proceed to vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. I have it. Motion passes. We will work on the podcast every Wednesday before school in the ad room. The floor is open. Madam Chair. Samara. I'm going to require all members to assist on Wednesdays. Second. Second. Motion is made by Samara and seconded to require all members to assist on Wednesdays. Is there any debate? Madam, Madam Chair. Chair. Samara. I urge the assembly to pass this motion. Having Requiring all of our members to come and assist um, with this podcast on Wednesday will make sure that we have enough people to make sure that we're getting this done properly and have the proper information put in these podcasts. Both being passed in this motion. Is there any further debate? Madam, Madam Chair. Chair. Katie. I rise in disagreement with this motion. It is not sensible for our chapter to require members to come to this event. The podcasts are meant to be in educational. We want people to uh, offer themselves up to help with these podcasts. Vote no. Is there any further debate? Madam Chair. William. Please help me in failing this motion. In our, in the FFA motto, it says, um, earning to, or living to serve. This would, would not simply be um, what the FFA stands for. For these reasons, I hope you can clearly see that the firm, or the negative vote is the only plausible way to vote. Is there any further debate? I ask permission to withdraw the motion. Are there any objections? Motion withdrawn. The floor is open. Madam, Madam Chair. 
Allie. I move to advertise these podcasts on social media. Second. Motion is made by Alec and seconded to advertise these podcasts on social media. Is there any debate? Madam Chair. At I rise to speak in favor of this motion. Advertising these podcasts on social media will allow us to reach out to most of the parts of our community and those who do not have social media may be able to hear about it through other members of our community who do have social media. This would be a great way to make sure that we reach out to as many people as we possibly can. Vote yes on this motion. Is there any further debate? Madam Chair. William. I move to refer this motion to Committee of Three, appointed by the Chair with the power to act and report back at the next regular meeting. Second. The motion is made by William and seconded to refer this motion to a Committee of Three, appointed by the Chair with the power to act and report back at the next regular meeting. Is there any debate? Madam, Madam Chair. William. Please help me in passing this motion. Three people um, would be um, super easy and simple to manage, having three people manage this post, because there may be a lot of comments that need to be responded to. And um, and we have a lot of followers on our Facebook page. Vote yes. Is there any further debate? Madam Chair. Megan. I rise in favor of this referral. We Having members work on this will allow us to have the right time and proper resources to um, develop these pods on social media. Vote yes. Is there any further debate? Hearing none, it will now proceed to vote. All those in favor of referring this motion to a committee of three appointed by the chair with the power to act and report back at the next regular meeting say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. Ayes have it, referral passes. The committee will consist of Katie, Samara, and Megan as chair. The floor is open. Madam Chair. Samara. I move to have the support group committee chair ask alumni members to be in a podcast. Second. The motion is made by Smart and seconded to have the support group committee chair ask the alumni members to be in a podcast. Is there any debate? Madam, Madam Chair. Samara. Vote with me in passing this motion. Having our um, alumni members in this podcast uh, will give the listeners a first-hand view of what uh, local farmers go through every day. Vote with me in passing this motion. Is there any further debate? Madam Chair. Katie. I rise in favor of this motion. Our alumni are connected to the farmers in many ways and will be able to give us accurate information on topics that are important to the agricultural community. I move to limit debate to one debate per member on the pending motion. Second. The motion is made by Katie and seconded to limit debate to one debate per member on the pending motion. Are there any amendments? Thank you, Madam Timekeeper. Eight minutes and 15 seconds has elapsed. Hearing none, we will not proceed to vote. All those in favor of limiting debate to one debate per member on the pending motion, please rise. Thank you, be seated. All opposed, please rise. Five to zero, debate is limited. Is there any debate on the motion? Madam Chair. Chair. Alec. I rise to lend my support to this motion. Many of our alumni have either been involved in agriculture or are still involved in agriculture, and having them speak will make sure that we can provide firsthand knowledge about agriculture so that everyone who listens to these podcasts will be well informed. For these reasons, pass this motion. Is there any further debate? Hearing none, we will not proceed to vote. All those in favor of having this support group committee chair ask the alumni members to be in one of the podcasts say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. Ayes have it, motion passes. We will have the support group committee chair ask the alumni members to be in one of the podcasts. The floor is open. Madam, Madam chair. chair. Samara. I move to have the secretary ask her video editing class to borrow their equipment. Second. The motion is made by Samara and seconded to have the secretary ask the video editing class to borrow their equipment. Is there any debate? Madam, Madam Chair. Samara. I urge the assembly to pass this motion. Having um, our video editing classes materials will make sure that we can get these uh, podcasts professionally done so that they sound um, good to all of our listeners and they will continue to listen. Vote with me in passing this motion. Is there any further debate? Madam Chair. Megan. I urge the assembly to vote yes on this motion. We need um, the right proper materials to make these podcasts and it would not take up too much time from the video class. Vote yes on this motion. Is there any further debate? Thank you, Madam Timekeeper. Nine minutes and 45 seconds has elapsed. Hearing none, we will not proceed to vote. All those in favor of having the secretary as the video, ask the video editing class to borrow their equipment, say aye. 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 All opposed say no. Ayes have it, motion passes. We will have the secretary ask the video editing class to borrow their equipment. Is there any further, the floor is open. Is there any further business? Announcements? Meeting adjourned. Thank you, Madam Timekeeper. This concludes our presentation. Honorable judges, we are now ready to entertain any questions you may have. Good afternoon. We are the New Lothrop Ag Issues Team 1. Today, we will be discussing hemp farms, a boon for farmers, 
or a bus for small communities, our presentation will focus on the pros and cons of hemp farms and agriculture, and more specifically, how hemp farms impact farmers and community members. The setting for our presentation will be a podcast focusing on hot agricultural topics in Michigan. My name is Michaela Lino, and I will be playing the neutral role of the podcast host. I will be deciding whether or not to sell my land to a hemp farm. Hi, I'm Delaney Bitterman, and I will be acting as a hemp farmer who is convincing Michaela to sell her farmland to my company. I will be supporting the pro side of this argument. Hi, I'm Danielle Wanling, and I'll be playing the role of a concerned and angry community member. I do not want a hemp farm growing next to my house. Welcome back to the Future of Agriculture podcast. I'm your host, Michaela Lino, and today I am joined with Delaney Bitterman and Danielle Wenling. Today, we will be discussing how hemp farms are beneficial and detrimental to farmers and the community. In 2018, President Trump legalized hemp in the Farm Bill. This bill provides regulations for growth of the plant. This is a very controversial topic. Today, we have guests representing both sides of the issue. Why don't you ladies introduce yourselves? Hi everyone, my name is Delaney and I am a hemp farmer. Last year is my third year growing hemp. I farmed five acres and I'm hoping to expand my company. Hi, I'm Danielle and I am not too happy with the thought of hemp farms coming into my community. I do not see any benefits to this farming. It will make our entire community smell. Also, do we really want our community to be full of marijuana? I know I don't wanna see people smoking marijuana every time I leave my house. Hang on, Danielle. Hemp is completely different from marijuana. My farm does not produce marijuana. However, we do produce hemp. Yes, hemp and marijuana are the same plant, but they're not the same. There is one key difference, the THC. THC stands for tetrahydrocannabinol. This is the psychoactive chemical in cannabis. Legally, hemp must contain 0.3% THC or less. If there is any more THC in the plant, it is legally considered marijuana. If this happens, you must follow the marijuana laws. Even if marijuana is legal in your state, you must dispose of it, unless you have the proper licensing to produce marijuana. How do you dispose of cannabis? There are many different ways to dispose of the cannabis plants. Most are environmentally friendly. These processes include plowing under, mulching, disking, brush mowing, and deep burial. However, there are a few less environmentally friendly methods of disposal, such as burning and sending the plants to landfills. So that's how you dispose of these plants. But can someone walk me through how they are produced? Delaney probably has more knowledge about this topic than me. However, through my research, I found that hemp plants should be planted about three and a half feet apart. This is because if they are too close together, their leaves will rub together and create a more potent smell. I also read it takes about four months to grow a hemp plant and they reach anywhere from five to 10 feet in height. One topic I was researching but didn't quite understand was the pollination process of hemp and the difference between male and female plants. Delaney, would you like to elaborate on these topics? Well, the difference between male and female hemp plants is that the male plants grow pollen nodes as sacs which are used for pollination. The female plants grow bracts. This is where the CBD and THC comes from. Male hemp plants are only used for pollination, while female plants are harvested for hemp products. When around the female plants, the male plants release pollen, which triggers the female plants to produce seeds. Farmers do not want to keep male hemp plants for very long as it lowers the amount of CBD a female plant can produce. Pollen from male plants can travel much more than 10 miles. However, if it does travel more than 10 miles, the chance for cross-pollination is slim. Okay, so I now understand how these plants are produced and disposed of, but can someone walk me through what hemp is used for? I know it can be used for therapeutic purposes, but is that the extent of its uses? I do know that hemp has several different uses. According to the Rodale Institute, there are over 25,000 uses of hemp. The seed, fiber, and stock can each be used for different reasons. The fiber and stock have a variety of uses, including clothing, construction material, paper, and plastic composites. 
The seed and flour are used in health foods and body care products. According to Michigan.gov, the most common use of hemp in Michigan is CBD or floral. Wow, I didn't realize hemp had so many uses. However, do the benefits of it actually outweigh the smell you endure while living near these farms? Yes, that is a big concern of mine. I am concerned about selling my land because I do not want to live near that smell. While I was researching, I discovered that the smell of hemp can travel up to 1,500 yards. According to the Providence Journal, the smell of hemp has been found to cause headaches, nausea, and can worsen allergies. I do not want to have to live near the smell of hemp for the rest of my life, and no one should have to deal with the constant headaches and nausea. Yes, hemp does have a skunk-like smell, However, the benefits definitely exceed the problems caused by the scent. Shouldn't farmers take into consideration the effect this will have on the community? As a community member myself, I have helped build this town from the ground up and I do not want to see it run into the ground by bringing in these hemp farms. I cannot foresee the benefits of these farms outweighing the issues caused by the smell of hemp plants. I foresee this driving people out of our community and I do not think any new members will want to move into a community full of hemp. This will run our economy into the ground. Also, according to Realtor.com, homes within a half a mile of a cannabis business have a lower property value than homes in the same county that are further out. And neighborhoods with a growth facility are the least desirable, with an 8.4% price discount. No one will be able to sell their land if a hemp farm is brought in. Yes, there is the issue of driving surrounding property value down if a hemp farm is implemented. However, in 2019, Cropland sold for $4,500 per acre. This means that farmers are making money off of the cropland. This will bring money back into the towns where the hemp farms are brought in. Well, that's great that one farmer benefits from the sale of their land. But what about the countless community members in the surrounding area that will lose out? When talking to my realtor about selling my land, he stated that hemp farms tend to drive surrounding property value down. He explained that even if a house is perfect, people will not move in due to the hemp farms surrounding it. Delaney, we have been talking a lot about the negative impacts of hemp farms. Would you like to discuss more of its positive impacts? Well, Michaela, you pointed out a pro earlier and I would like to elaborate on it. You pointed out how hemp is very environmentally friendly. As stated, hemp only takes four months to grow while trees can take years. Hemp can be used in place of trees to make paper. Hemp also requires less water to grow and has a natural resistance to pests. This means that the use of pesticides is not necessary when growing hemp. Hemp also adds diversity to crop rotations, which improves soil health. Furthermore, hemp is basically a natural air purifier. Hemp can rapidly consume carbon dioxide, making the air we breathe much cleaner. For every ton of hemp produced, it can consume 1.63 tons of carbon dioxide. This makes hemp much more effective than trees as it takes one tree 40 years to consume one ton of carbon dioxide. I did not realize how environmentally friendly hemp plants were. Not only is it good for the environment, it can also help people. If someone is dealing, dealing with chronic pain, CBD oils and lotions can help. Also in cases of childhood epilepsy diseases, such as Dravet syndrome and lennox gastro syndrome. These are diseases that had little improvement with anti-seizure medicines. However, when CBD was used, the number of seizures decreased, or in some cases, stopped altogether. According to a large-scale study, CBD was also used to help treat pediatric epilepsy. The study showed that through the use of CBD, the number of seizures decreased by 50% in 43% of patients with Dravet syndrome. The FDA has also approved Epidolex, an anti-seizure medicine containing CBD used to help treat childhood seizure disorders. I was doing a little research of my own and discovered that the CBD in hemp is used to treat many common illnesses, such as anxiety, depression, insomnia, arthritis, and more. The Neurotherapeutics Journal published a stu study in 2015 stating that the CBD in hemp was effective for treating generalized anxiety disorder, OCD, panic disorder, social anxiety disorder, and PTSD. There are many different ways that CBD can be used to help our community members. I see that CBD has many different ways it can positively impact our community members. However, does pain relief really justify an increased crime rate? Just last year, six men were arrested in St. Joseph County. 
This is just one report of many hemp farm robberies in the past year. In New York, one farmer reported being robbed every night. In California, three robberies occurred within two weeks. And in Texas, a juvenile was arrested for attempting to rob a hemp farm. These are just a few of the many different reports over the past year. This can have a detrimental impact on the farmer's profit as the average price of hemp is anywhere from $175 to $325 per pound. Danielle, I'm glad you brought that issue up. I read an article in the local newspaper explaining how a man from the Detroit area was arrested in Chesaning for attempting to break into a mar medical marijuana facility. He was attempting to steal cannabis plants and was carrying counterfeit cash. In the article, a concerned citizen stated that he is not surprised with this crime and hopes it is not an indication of what is to come in the village. Although this was a medical marijuana farm, you can see how this could just as easily happen to a hemp farm, being that there is such a misconception between these farms. If this robbery happened a few miles away, who was to say it wouldn't happen to my land that I sell to a hemp farm? I also read the same article. Several local citizens were concerned about this crime. This man drove two hours to rob this facility. My small town is nervous about outsiders like this coming into our community. This man was charged and convicted with the intent to rob the facility and the intent to sell the marijuana. You're absolutely right. There is a major misconception. Hemp and marijuana are the same plant and they're grown the same way. However, as I stated earlier, hemp only has a 0.3% THC level, while marijuana is anything over 0.3%. Since both originate from the same seed, I can definitely understand the confusion. However, if people did more research and were more informed about the differences between hemp and marijuana, there would not be as much of an issue. Thank you for your opinions and information. I now have a better understanding on this topic and will look more into whether or not I want to sell my land. Before we end our podcast, let's recap our thoughts on this issue. Pro number one, hemp is very environmentally friendly. It is a natural air purifier and can be disposed of in an environmentally safe manner. Pro number two, hemp has over 25,000 uses. The most common use of hemp in Michigan is CBD or floral. Pro number three, CBD can be used to help with physical and mental health issues. According to the World Health Organization, CBD helps calm the brain and supports the hippocampus, a brain area important for healthy emotion and memory. Con number one, hemp produces a nauseating smell that has been shown to cause issues such as nausea, headaches, and worsened allergies. Con number two, hemp farms cause an increase in crime rate. People are unaware of the difference between hemp and marijuana. As a result, they rob these farms, thinking they're stealing cannabis plants, when in reality, it is hemp. Con number three, hemp farms cause a decrease in surrounding property value. Realtor.com stated that homes near a hemp grow facility have noticed an 8.4% decrease in property value. All right, guys, thank you for joining the Future of Agriculture podcast. Don't forget to like our Facebook and Instagram and let us know what you think. Are hemp farms a boon for farmers or a bus for small communities? We'll let you decide. Timekeeper, this concludes our presentation. We will now entertain any questions the honorable judges may have. Thank you. Good afternoon, honorable judges, fellow FFA members, and guests. We're the Niles Greenham Connacht Meetings team. Before we begin, I would like to introduce you to my teammates starting on my left. Lexi Herman, serving as secretary. Ryan Murphy, serving as advisor. Audrey Dixon, serving as vice president. Arlie Wagley, serving as sentinel. Drew George, serving as treasurer. Pat Mal, serving as reporter. And myself, Tristan Peterson, serving as president. Mr. Timekeeper, we are ready to begin our presentation. The meeting room will come to order. We are now holding a meeting of the Niles of the Bay chapter. Madam Vice President, are all officers at their stations? I shall call the roll of officers, determine they're at their stations, and report back to you, Mr. President. The Sentinel, station by the door, your duty's there. Through this door pass many friends of the FFA. It is my duty to see that the door is open to our friends at all times and that they are welcome. I care for the meeting room and paraphernalia. I strive to keep the room comfortable and assist the president in maintaining order. 
The reporter. The reporter is stationed by the flag. Why by the flag? As the flag covers the United States of America, so I strive to inform the people in order that every man, woman, and child may know that the FFA is a national organization that reaches from the state of Alaska to the Virgin Islands and from the state of Maine to Hawaii. The treasure. Stationed at the emblem of Washington. Your duty's there. I keep a record of receipts and disbursements just as Washington kept his farm accounts, carefully and accurately. I encourage thrift among the members to strive to build up our financial savings through savings and investments. George Washington was better able to serve his country because he was financially independent. The secretary. Stationed by the ear of corn. Your duty's there. I keep an accurate record of all meetings and correspond with other secretaries wherever corn has grown and FFA members meet. The advisor. Here by the owl. Why stationed by the owl? The owl is a time-honored emblem of knowledge and wisdom. Being older than the rest of you, I am asked to advise you from time to time as the need arises. I hope that my advice will always be based on true knowledge and ripened with wisdom. Madam Vice President, why do you keep a plow at your station? The plow is a symbol of labor and tillage soil. Without labor, neither knowledge nor wisdom can accomplish much. My duties require me to assist at all times in directing the work of our organization. I preside over meetings in the absence of our president, whose place is beneath the rising sun. Why is the president so stationed? The rising sun is the token of a new era in agriculture. If we follow the leadership of our president, we shall be led out of the darkness of selfishness and into the glorious sunlight of brotherhood and cooperation. Mr. President, all officers are at their stations. Thank you, Madam Vice President. The secretary will call the roll of members. There are seven members and numerous guests present, Mr. President. Thank you. FFA members, why are we here? To, to practice brotherhood, honor agricultural opportunities and responsibilities, and to develop those qualities of leadership which an FFA membership possess. May we accomplish our purposes. I now declare this meeting of the Niles of the Fay chapter duly open for the transaction of business or attention to any matters which may properly be presented. Mr. Mr. President, President Lexi. I move to suspend the rules by dispensing the readings of the secretary's minutes, the treasurer's reports, and all other committee reports, and to proceed with the business at hand. Second. Second. It's been moved by Lexi and seconded by Drew to suspend the rules by dispensing the readings of the secretary's minutes, the treasurer's reports, and all other committee reports, and to proceed with the business at hand. Since this requires a two-thirds vote, we will now proceed to do so by rising. All those in favor of the suspension of the rules, please rise. Thank you, be seated. All those opposed, please rise. Thank you, be seated. Six zero suspension of the rules passes. Mr. Mr. President, President. Audrey. I move to plan and promote a local agri-science agri fair. Second. Second. It has been moved by Audrey and seconded by Drew to plan and promote a local agri-science fair. Is there any debate? Mr. Mr. President, President. Audrey. By completing this activity, we are showing part of our motto, which states, doing to learn. Pass this motion. Mr. Mr. President. Mr. President. Ryan. I'm, I'm in favor of this motion because this will help our community know what we do, more of what we do, pass this motion. Mr. President. Arlie. I am in support of this motion, seeing as it will look amazing on our program of activities and show that we are growing leaders. Pass this motion. Is there any more debate? Seeing none, we will now proceed to vote. All those in favor to plan and promote a local agri-science fair, say, ha say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. I have it. Motion carries. Mr. Mr. President. President. Ryan. I move that we have the Agri Science Fair the first week of December. Second. It's been moved by Ryan and seconded by Lexi that we have the Agri Science Fair on the first week of December. Is there any debate? Mr. Mr. President. President. Ryan. Having this in December will give us time to plan and create this fair. Pass this motion. Mr. Mr. President. President. Drew. I move to amend this motion by adding the words to the end at 1 p.m. Second. It's been moved by Drew and seconded by Audrey to amend the motion by adding the words to the end at 1 p.m. Is there any debate on the amendment? Mr. Mr. President. President. Drew. The purpose of this amendment is to have it at 1 p.m. so we have plenty of time to complete our activities. Pass this amendment. Mr. President. Lexi. I move to the previous question on all pending questions. Second. The previous question on all pending questions has been called for. Since this requires a two-thirds vote, we will now proceed to do so by rising. All those in favor of moving the previous question on all pending questions, please rise. Thank you, be seated. All those opposed, please rise. Thank you, be seated. 5-1, previous question on all pending questions passes. We will now proceed to vote on the amendment, which states to, to add the words to the end at 1 p.m. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. Ayes have it, amendment passes. We will now proceed to vote on the motion, which states to have the Agri Science Fair on the first, during the first week of December at 1 p.m. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. Ayes have it, motion as amended carries. Floor is now open. Mr. Mr. President. President. Arlie. 
I move to have our secretary ask our graphics class to create a banner. Second. It has been moved by Arlen and second by Lexi to have the secretary ask our graphics class to create a banner. Is there any debate? Mr. Mr. President. President. Arlen. The purpose of this motion is to include our CTE classes, classes on those tasks that we handle. Pass this motion. Mr. President. Audrey. The district has spent a lot of money to further the things in our graphics facility. By you using utilizing these facilities, we will be um, by utilizing these facilities, we will be using their the resources that they spent a lot of money on. Pass this motion. Mr. President. True. I'm in favor of this program because this banner will look very good in the pro at, at the program. Pass this motion. Is there any more debate? Seeing none, we will now proceed to vote. All those in favor to have the secretary ask the graphics class to create a banner, say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. I have it. Motion carries. Mr. President. Audrey. I move to have the Sentinel make social media posts to promote the Agri Science Fair. Second. It has been moved by Audrey and second by Lexi to have, set, to have the Sentinel make social media posts about the Agri Science Fair. Is there any debate? Mr. Mr. President. President. Audrey. By putting the Sentinel in charge of this duty, we know that it will get done very well. Pass this motion. Mr. President. Arlie. By posting this on social media, most who follow our accounts will get a notification making sure that nobody misses this. Pass this motion. Mr. President. Drew. I'm not in favor of this motion because everyone on social media is not invited to this event. Fail this motion. Mr. President. Right. I'm also not in favor of this motion because most parents don't let their children have phones. Fail this motion. <laughs> Is there any more debate? Seeing none, we will now proceed to vote. All those in favor of the Sentinel make social media posts about the Agri Science Fair say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. No. I have it. Motion carries. I call for a division of the assembly. A division of the assembly has been called for. We will now proceed to re-vote on the motion which states that the Sentinel makes social media posts about the Agri Science Fair by rising. All those in favor, please rise. Thank you, be seated. All those opposed, please rise. Thank you, be seated. Four, two, motion passes. The floor is now open. Mr. Mr. President. President. Drew. I move that we have an award for the best project. Second. second. It has been moved by Drew and seconded by Ryan that we have an award for the best project. Is there any debate? Mr. Mr. President. President. Drew. I'm in, the purpose of this motion is to, is to show that, the, that hard work pays off and that you will get an award for your project. Pass this motion. Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Timekeeper. Arlie. I'm in favor of this motion, seeing as this will give a competitive edge to this fair and make people work harder on their projects. Pass this motion. Is there any more debate? Mr. President. Audrey. By having an award, people, the, people, the person who got the award may keep it so that they can look back and see all the memories they had that related to ag. Pass this motion. Is there any more debate? Seeing none, we will now proceed to vote. All those in favor that we have an award for the best project, say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. I have it. Motion carries. Mr. President. Arlie. I move to decorate. I move to have the Agri Science Fair in the high school gym. Second. second. It has been moved by Arlie and second by Drew to have the Agri Science Fair in the high school gym. Is there any debate? Mr. Mr. President. President. Arlie. The purpose of this motion is to give the Agri Science Fair lots of room and make sure that it's safe for COVID protocols. Pass this motion. Mr. President. Audrey. By having this in the gym, it will allow students from our high school to see the projects as well, which may interest them in Agri Science. Pass this motion. Is there any more debate? Seeing none, we will now proceed to vote. All those in favor to have the Agri Science Fair in the high school gym say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. Ayes have it. Motion carries. The floor is now open. Mr. President. Mr. President. Peyton. I move to have the advisor ask the principal for permission to use the gym. Second. It has been moved by Peyton and second by Arlie to have the advisor ask the principal for permission to use the gym. Is there any debate? Mr. Mr. President. President. Peyton. By having the advisor ask permission to use a gym, we'll make sure that there are no winter sports going on. Pass this motion. Mr. Mr. President. Arlie. I'm in favor of this motion, seeing as asking the principal will show that we are organized with the things that we do. Pass this motion. Is there any more debate? Seeing none, we will now proceed to vote. All those in favor to have the advisor ask the principal to use the gym, say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. I have it. Motion carries. Mr. Mr. President. President. Lexi. I move that the people who have a presentation wear official dress. Second. Second. It has been moved by Lexi and second by Ryan that the people who have a presentation wear official dress. Is there any debate? I object to the consideration of this question. Objection to the consideration of the question has been called for. Shall the question be considered? Since this requires a two-thirds vote, we will now proceed to do so by rising. 
All those in favor of considering the question, please rise. Thank you, be seated. All those opposed, please rise. Thank you, be seated. Two, four, questions shall not be considered. Thank you, Mr. Timekeeper. Madam Secretary, do you have a record of any further business which should now be transacted? I have none, Mr. President. Does any member know of any new or unfinished business which should probably come before this meeting? We are about to adjourn this meeting of the Niles of the Fay chapter. As we mingle with others, let us be diligent in labor, just in our dealings, courteous to everyone, and above all, honest and fair in the game of life. Fellow members and guests, join me in a salute to our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. I now declare this meeting adjourned. This is Dr. Lee, who concludes our presentation. You will now answer any questions the honorable judges may have. Good evening, judges. My name is Slater McFarland, and I represent the Perry Epic Fit Chapter with my speech entitled African Swinekeeper, an incurable disease. Timekeeper, I am ready to begin. Imagine this. You just got it. Your first litter of pigs to race for your county fair. You built a pet for them, and you're just getting the hang of morning and evening chores. One day during the downpour, you go out to check on your pig and find one of them being trampled. When you reach him, you realize he is still alive and breathing, but won't move any of his muscles. Stumped, you call the farm you bought the pigs from to see if he has any suggestions. After a couple of different treatments, you finally realize the cause is unknown and the problem is incurable. Incurable. Imagine having an issue right in front of you that is incurable. African swine fever is just that, a viral disease with no vaccine or treatment that's accounted for the death of over 8 million hogs worldwide in the past four years according to the World Organization for Animal Health. This type of spreadable, incurable disease poses a serious threat to the swine industry in the United States. Today, I'm going to talk about the history of African swine fever, the current statistics of the disease, and important prevention methods for keeping this disease out of the United States and off of your farm. So what is African swine fever or ASF? African swine fever is caused by a virus that affects both domesticated and feral hogs. Different from bacteria, a virus relies on a living cell to grow, reproduce, and successfully infect the host. Once the virus enters the host, it connects to one of the host cells and begins replicating. In many cases, there are vaccinations that protect animals from being affected from common viruses. Unfortunately, there is no current vaccine that protects pigs from ASF. A pig that has ASF will commonly show fever, anorexia, hemorrhages, vomiting, diarrhea, abortion, and death. Because there is no treatment for ASF, a pig that has it will continue to spread it to other pigs that they come into contact with. This continual spread of infections can be detrimental to pig farms. In most all cases, a pig with ASF will either die naturally from the virus or will be called to alleviate from further spread. Let's rewind and talk about where ASF began and how it has spread. The first case of African swine fever was in Kenya in 1921. At the time, they didn't know it was ASF, but once it became discovered and known, it spread fast throughout many countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. The disease seemed to have slowed for the next 30 years, but then it was found in Portugal in 1951. While in Portugal, the disease spread rapidly and eventually hit Spain. In 2007, the virus was found in many European countries. Most recently, the World Organization for Animal Health reported ASF in four new countries throughout 2020. Thankfully, even through continued spread, ASF has yet to hit the United States or any part of the Western Hemisphere. African swine fever is not a zoonotic disease, meaning it cannot spread to humans. 
However, it can be transmitted through humans. Even though this virus won't affect us, we can still carry this disease on our clothes, shoes, or bodies. This can create a more detailed issue of transmission as people who travel may unknowingly spread the virus from one farm to another. This is why U.S. Customs is so important for international travel. In order to successfully keep diseases like ASF out of the United States, we must monitor travelers who have visited farms in countries with the virus. Following biosecurity measures is vital for decreasing the spread from farm to farm or from nation to nation. After traveling, stay away from pigs for at least five days. This includes zoos, farms, or auctions. Some common biosecurity measures in the hog industry include washing your shoes and clothes after visiting a farm, shower facilities upon entry, and confinement operations with limited visitors. If a farm does have their own biosecurity measures in place, it is vital that you follow them. The USDA instructs all farmers to report any pig showing symptoms to their local veterinarian or animal health official. One setback we see this far is that symptoms of African swine fever are similar to those of the swine flu. This can lead to unintentional spread because of improper reporting. Worldwide, we see over 8 million hogs affected by ASF. Improper reporting can cause these numbers to rise out of control and cause unintentional consequences. One major consequence of this disease spreading is the overall pork production. Between the ASF spread throughout 2018 and 2019, China lost most of its swine herd. Animal losses came from both infected hogs and farmer prevention to keep the disease off of their farm. The FAO officially reported that 1.1 million pigs were killed in China in the past three years due to ASF. This disease caused China's pork production to decrease. An earlier prediction from the USDA indicates that China could have a 33% decrease in pork production in 2020. With this production decrease comes problems with importing and exporting. In order to provide the pork they used to have, China is expected to double their pork imports from other countries, but this won't cover their full loss. Consumers, cafeterias, and food service businesses are trying to fill this gap with more chicken and beef. The setbacks China is experiencing has had positive effects on the U.S. pork industry, allowing us to expand our large commercial farms to provide more exports to China. But this is only possible because we do not have ASF in the United States. The long-term effects of African swine fever spreading throughout China show just what the U.S. could see if this virus were to reach our country. If we encountered this virus, we would have to stop all pork exports, which according to Dr. Dermot Hayes at Iowa State University, currently accounts for 25 to 30% of our pork production, not to mention the contact tracing that would be in place to help diminish the spread. An economic study done by Dr. Hayes predicts that if ASF were to reach our country, it would cost us $50 billion in just 10 years. It is important to keep up to date with diseases in our world, even if they are currently affecting our area. As diseases like ASF spread, pork farmers are continually fighting repercussions of sick pigs and sometimes even call their herds because of rapid spread. Knowing the disease history, where it's at, how it can spread, and how it affects animals can help us fight this virus. Even though we do not have ASF in our country, it is still vital to consider when you encounter a sick pig. So next time you go to check on your herd and you find a pig acting abnormally, be sure to contact your veterinarian and consider all possibilities. Keeping African swine fever out of the United States is imperative to keep our hog industry flourishing. Timekeeper, this concludes my presentation. Judges, you have my reference sheet with my speech, and I'm ready for any questions that you may have.
Good morning, honorable judges and timekeeper. My name is Maze Guza, and I am proudly representing the Ugly FFA chapter in the Prepared Public Speaking Contest with my speech entitled, Cart Crackdown. Madam Timekeeper, I'm now ready to begin. My family and I enjoy going tubing on the Great Lakes. I love the feel of the wind rushing past me and the water splashing on me. I also love the rush of adrenaline that I get from holding on for dear life. Whenever I have the chance, I can be found hopping on my cousin's boat and getting ready for a wild ride. Now imagine this, my family and I, along with everyone else, are no longer able to go tubing on the Great Lakes. Boats with motors cannot enter the water and fishing is only allowed off of the pier. The water is not hazardous from crashing waves or chemicals. Instead, silver carp are to blame. Silver carp have been known to break ribs, legs, arms, noses, and jaws when they leap up to 10 feet out of the water when startled by loud noises. Silver carp are part of an invasive family of fish that are a massive threat to the Great Lakes. This group of fish is collectively referred to as Asian carp, but in addition to silver carp, they include black carp, big head carp, and brass carp. Each fish has unique tendencies, but they would all have devastating effects if they were to establish themselves in the Great Lakes. Grass carp are unique in the fact that they are the only invasive Asian carp already within Lake Huron, which is the closest Great Lake to me. The good news is that almost all of these fish are sterile. Of the 23 grass carp that have been captured, only a few have been classified as diploids, which are capable of reproducing. The threat the grass carp pose to the Great Lakes lies in their diets. Grass carp were first introduced to the United States for the purpose of aquatic plant control, which has now become the problem. Grass carp can eat up to 90 pounds of plants a day, which destroys native fish spawning areas and waterfowl habitat. They also expel half of the food that they digest, which results in algae blooms. Big head and silver carp also have a diet that is hazardous to the Great Lakes, but you will not find them chowing down on plants. Instead, these fish feed on phytoplankton and zooplankton. What makes this diet so threatening is that both big head and silver carp can eat up to 40% of their weight in these planktons throughout their entire life cycle. Most fish depend on plankton for the first part of their lives, and as they grow larger, they then eat fish that are smaller than them. Big head and silver carp were first introduced to the United States in 1973 to manage plankton in aquacultural facilities and culture ponds. Unfortunately, they have escaped. Three big head carp have been captured in Lake Erie while a single silver carp was captured within nine miles of Lake Michigan. The real heavy lifter of the group is the black carp, which can weigh up to 150 pounds and be six feet in length. These fish feed on mollusks and snails and pose a threat to both native mussel populations and native mollusk eating fish. Black carp were first introduced to the United States accidentally through shipments of grass carp. They later escaped through flooding and being included in bait. Of the Asian carp family, black carp inhabit the least number of states and are the furthest from the Great Lakes. Because Asian carp would be so detrimental to the Great Lakes, prevention is of the utmost importance. If Asian carp that were capable of reproducing establish themselves within the Great Lakes, native fish populations could be reduced to as little as 10% of the current population. The economy would also suffer greatly. Michigan's Great Lakes have over a $43 billion economic impact 
including $20 billion in state tour tour tourism spending, $16 billion in the boating industry, and $7 billion in Michigan's fishing industry. We have already seen the devastation that has occurred in other states from these fish, which has prompted some methods to manage them. A unique method that Kentucky has introduced is an annual competition called the Carp Madness Tournament. The prize is $10,000 and encourages local fishing teams to help reduce the big head carp population. Besides the awareness the event raises, teams are also able to remove over 40 tons of carp in just two days. Department of Natural Resources or DNR officers are also helping to control invasive Asian carp in several ways. They have provided emails, forms, and links that are readily available for reporting studies of Asian carp. They have also provided an abundant amount of information that helps educate the general public on Asian carp. Another key player in the fight against invasive Asian carp is the United States Army Corps of Engineers. They have designed several projects to help prevent the spread of invasive Asian carp, with the most vital being at the Chicago area waterway system. This project consists of three electric barriers and parasitic structures. The three electric barriers maintain an electric field within the water. Three barriers may seem excessive, but repairs periodically have to be made which powers down at least one of the barriers. The parasitic structures consist of steel shapes and woven wire rope that help to limit the electric field produced by each barrier. There is one parasitic structure for each barrier. Another newer project is also underway with the help of the United States Army Corps of Engineers. The Brandon Road Lock and Dam in Joliet, Illinois. Both Michigan and Illinois DNR will be helping with the completion of this project. This project will utilize electric barriers, loudspeakers, an air bubble curtain, and a flushing lock to help prevent the spread of invasive Asian carp. Federal, Illinois, and Michigan governments will be paying for the completion of this project. While the government is doing a wonderful job at preventing the spread of invasive Asian carp, there is so much that we can do too as individuals. The first step with any problem is to become educated. Being able to properly identify these fish, especially if you are a frequent fisher, is a great first step. You would then be ready to report any sightings of an Asian carp with a simple Google search of report Asian carp. You can also sign a petition on blockasiancarp.org. This simply allows those in positions of power to know that you will support their decision regarding preventative actions against invasive Asian carp. You can also advocate for additional funding for Asian carp prevention, send letters of support to those taking action, or try eating Asian carp to help with the abundance in other states. No matter how you take action, it can be agreed that Michigan needs to put the cap on invasive Asian carp. Thank you, Madam Timekeeper. That concludes my presentation. I will now entertain any questions the judges may have.